Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Houston Tech Fest 2020. Um, just wanted to let you more interactive. Um, please make note of the question mark icon on your presentation screen. Clicking that will open the question and answer feature, which will then allow you to send the moderator questions, which is myself in this case, um, and I'll deliver them to Drew, our presenter, at the appropriate time. So please feel free to post any time during the session. Um, we're also excited to let you know that Code Mag is going to be giving everyone attending today a free subscription, and Houston Fest will email everyone a link right after the event. We are now proud to present Drew Sheffman, a software engineer at Disney Streaming Services, who will be sharing the topic on the other way to scale Agile, how you as an individual can incorporate an Agile mindset, even if your org chart nodes disagree. And with that, Drew, I'll give it to you. Take it away. Thanks. So welcome to my session, The Other Way to Scale Agile. We'll be talking about how you as an individual can incorporate an Agile mindset. So first, I want to set some expectations. In terms of agileness, this presentation applies to all levels of agile adoption, but I'll assume for most of my conversation, uh, low to none um, for you and your teams. Also, when talking about the individual, um, this could be that you are on a team all by yourself. You could uh, work with others, but lack the teamwork that you desire. You could have a strong team, but feel isolated, especially now with the remote work or you have a strong team and you're just looking to improve. Also during this conversation, uh, your mileage may vary. Some of my suggestions require persistence or patience, creativity and courage. Um, and depending on the environment that you're in, some of them might fit your needs better than others. A lot of the recommendations that I'll be presenting have come from this book, Practices of an Agile Developer. Uh, and um, I highly recommend it. it. It has a lot of good tips and tricks in addition to what I'll be presenting here. A little bit about me before we dive in. My name is Drew Sheffman. I have 24 years as a software developer, 20 years as an agile advocate, 16 years actually being remote. I've been on dozens of teams ranging from myself to over 30 people, both low and high performing teams, waterfall and agile. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and my blog is at squaredeye.com. And with that, let's jump right in. So the, the, this presentation is about an Agile mindset and how you can have one as, what it, what, what it means as an individual to have one. Um, to define an Agile mindset, it's the Agile development uses feedback to make constant adjustments in a highly collaborative environment. And to break this down a little bit more, Feedback, in this case, means information which is used as a basis for improvement. Constant adjustments, for the context of this conversation, is as they relate to feedback or collaboration. And collaboration, in this case, is the action or process of working with others to create something. So let's talk about some of the collaborators. I know that this presentation is for the individual. But one of the collaborators that you might want to consider is yourself in the future. So I think we've all had the case where we've created some, some code, some something, and come back in a couple of months and had no idea what we were talking about at the time. So I want you to consider one of the collaborators that you might be actually collaborating with is your future self. We'll also consider your team and your future team as other collaborators. And of course, your business, the clients, the customers, those are all part of the people uh, needed in this collaboration. So going back to this, this definition, this statement, that agile development uses feedback to make constant adjustments in a highly collaborative environment. Those are feedback adjustments and collaboration will be like the three pillars that I'll be talking about in this presentation. But first, I wanna review the agile principles and see how these fit into that. So as you're probably aware, there are 12, there are 12 Agile principles. 50% um, of those relate to the individuals. So I've listed six of them on the screen. Now the numbers that you see on the screen are the number related to the principles. So I didn't just count up to six, but so the first principle says, satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable working software. 
Two, welcome changing requirements. Three, deliver working software frequently. Number seven, the seventh principle, says working software is the primary measure of progress. Number nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. And number 10, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. So these six principles are all only related to the individual. Moving on, three of the principles, so 25% of the principles are for the individual and the team, and they're highlighted here on this slide. So principle number four, business and developers must work together daily through the whole project. Number six, the most effective method for conveying information is face-to-face -face conversation. And number 12, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes its behaviors accordingly. Now, I underline this one because it says the team reflects, but in order for the team to reflect, you as an individual have to do your own reflection and own introspection to figure out how to become more effective. So that one's kind of a special case. Then just for completeness, the last three, the last 25% is for management, but I'm not gonna read them out to you because they're not related to the presentation. They're there, just there for completeness. So now that we have the, the review of the Agile mindset, or sorry, we have reviewed the Agile principles, we'll like go into the Agile mindset and discuss the feedback, the adjustments, and the collaboration that you can use as an individual. Starting off with the feedback. So one source for feedback, and one of the main sources for feedback as an individual is the code. Now this is really important. It's so important that I'm going to say it again with a picture in a much larger font. So the code is an incredible source of feedback for you as an individual. And when I say the code, I specifically mean tests, tests that you have around your code. So tests, unit tests, integration tests are the fastest feedback loop that you have available to yourself. If you have tests, some languages and some uh, environments allow for continuous tests, which means that you'll get feedback as you're typing your code in. When you have tests, it gives you the confidence that the, that the code meets expectations. So if you have a test where you have encoded what the input and the ex expected output is, you now have confidence that your tests, or you have confidence that your code works because your tests pass. It exposes unhappy paths and edge cases. So as you're creating your tests, you can say what happens if this value is null or what happens if the user goes off on this other path. And you can explore those things and create much more robust code and much uh, with, with better feedback that you're getting. It re reveals potential couplings. And this one's pretty cool because the harder, the harder it is to write your tests, the more coupled your tests are to the rest of your code. If you have to import different modules and set up your config files and, and do a whole bunch of different setup work just to get the test run, it might mean that your code is not as uh, separated and as isolated as it could be. Again, another good source for feedback for how to improve your code and how to improve your product. But overall, having tests, the biggest benefit that that's there is the confidence to go fast. Because when you have tests in place, you can iterate quickly, you can make changes, and if the tests pass, you'll have a high confidence to know that you didn't break anything and it still works as expected. So with, te with tests, the goal is to have a natural, reflexive, and confident way to create or modify your code. So going back to the Agile principles, in reviewing those, 25% of the 12 Agile principles talked about working software. And if you have tests that validate that you have software that is working, your tests are the sentries for this Agile principle. Your tests are there to prove that what you are indeed making does indeed work. I think that's hugely valuable. So the next thing that your code can tell you in terms of feedback is warnings. So when compiling your code or checking the syntax of your code, sometimes there are warnings. The warnings are the line is too long. Are you sure that you or you have a variable that's not being used? I, I'd like to assert that I, you should treat all these warnings as errors, not because they are errors, but because they are potentially a future bug. 
And if they're not a feature bug, they are definitely a distraction. Because what's going to happen is, let's say you have like hundreds of errors or hundreds of uh, warnings that you know the line is too long or or you have uh, not used a variable. But then every time that that code compiles, you're going to have to look at those warnings and say, is there a new warning in here that is truly something I should be concerned about? Or is this warning the same one that's always been here that I can ignore? And if there if you've removed all warnings and treat all warnings as errors, then those then the warnings that do show up are indeed warnings. And you don't have to cognitively process, oh, this line is too long, this line is too long, this variable is not used. So warnings are only future distractions or future bugs. And uh, eliminating them or treating them like errors is a good way to help move faster in your code and get good feedback from the code that you're writing. Another source of feedback is obviously your team. Now, given that this is a presentation for an individual, if your team is good at giving feedback and however that happens, that's awesome. But if not, you still have code reviews. And whether or not your team actively participates in code review doesn't matter. Um, hopefully, you have a central re repository where everyone commits their code to. And even if you don't have active code reviews, um, you read their code, see what other people are doing. Um, if you are on a team of one, find an open source project where people are contributing in the same language or the same framework and see the, see the patterns that they're using, see the um, structures that they're putting in. So reading code is a really good way of getting feedback um, and hopefully getting that from your team. Retrospectives are another fantastic place to get feedback from your team. And if your team is not holding retrospectives or you're not um, an agile team or you don't have them, still individually reflect on like your work, on what, what you're outputting, what can you do better? Um, where are your bottlenecks? What are you feeling? And can you make improvements for yourself that would uh, benefit the project going forward benefit the value you're delivering. Um, and if your team is currently not doing retrospectives or postmortems, advocate for them. See if you can have a, I'd like to discuss what's going on. I'd like to make improvements or even just start with, let's gripe around the water cooler, but let's take away one actionable item from that, you know, from that gripe session. Other sources of feedback are the business, the client, the customers. And this should be pretty obvious. Um, the, the output of the product, the, whoever this product affects most, they're the feedback that is most valuable. That's, that's the feedback that you, that you desperately want. Um, and I have a picture on here of Snape from Harry Potter saying obviously in his most perfect way saying it. I can't say it that way, but hopefully by having the picture here, you can, you can imagine Snape saying obviously the business or the client or the customer provides the best feedback. So between the code, the team, and your client, that's the, the small section for feedback. Now, at the end of each of these sections, I, I want to deliver an anecdote to you um, to kind of sum up that section. And I was trying to come up with a story for tests and the feedback that tests provide, but honestly, Tests makes for really boring stories. I could tell you about the time that we had a bug in our development system, or our deployment system, not development system, a bug in our deployment system where we accidentally released to production without the code going through QA, but we had tests in place and no one really even noticed because everything worked. I could tell you about the time that I was looking at a line of code and I didn't see any references to that line of code, so I deleted it and dozens of tests failed. Uh, almost immediately, so I put it back and realized that that line of code had value. Again, the stories when involving tests are not exciting stories, but the fact that they aren't exciting stories makes tests all that much more valuable for, for the feedback that it gives. So moving on to tactical adjustments, and these are adjustments and things that you can do that will get more feedback or better communication. Um, 
And the goal of these adjustments is to not actually get to the improvement. I mean, if getting to the improvement is great, but the goal is just to move the needle and increment closer. So if the improvement is a large step away, the goal of the, the adjustment that you should make should be, to, should be to make that step less large. So some of the adjustments, again, uh, can be applied to the code. And thinking about it, the code is the communication source. It is the source of, source of truth. It is the only communication source that is available to you that is both accurate and enduring. I say this because if you look at the documentation, that might not be what actually has been produced. If you look at the marketing, that might not be what is actually produced. But when you look at the code, that is what is produced. It is the same thing. And it's enduring. It's going to be what, what lives on well after you're done, well after the product has shipped. It's like, it is, it is the product. So it, it, is the only, it is the only communication source that's accurate. Also, the code is read, and I mean by humans, orders of magnitude more than it is edited or written. So anytime that there is a bug or a feature or even just a new person coming into the project, the code gets read. It gets read like 10 or 15 times, probably before it is ever even touched. And so with that, after the, the highest priority, after working software, after working code, comprehension should be the highest priority for the code base. This is, this, it should be readable, it should be easy to understand, it should be easy for you or your future self or a, your teammate or your new teammate, your future teammate, to come in and be able to understand what is going on with the code. So ways that you can improve the communication of your code is again with tests. Like tests allow you to declare the intent of what your code should do. They're executable, they're trackable with your uh, source code repositories, and they're always up to date form of documentation. Because if the tests are failing, that means that your source code has changed and you need to update your tests. If the tests are passing, it means that the source code is up to date and it's working. And it's a really good way of, of communicating what needs to happen in your code. Moving on to uh, mental adjustments, tactical adjustments you can apply to the process. So for the process, you want to integrate and isolate. And there's a tension between these, these two thoughts. So you want to attack the problems in isolation. That will give you the ability to iterate quickly on them and to narrow in on the problem but you wanna integrate the solutions to those problems nearly continuously. By definition, there's a linear relationship between the speed of integration and the response of potential feedback. So the more, the more often that you can integrate the, the code, the, the problem set into the, into the whole picture, into the whole app, the faster you'll be able to get feedback on, did you solve the problem? Is it working? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? But integrating into the whole app is time consuming and sometimes can lead to difficulty debugging and isolating the work that you want to, want to do. So integrating often will surface the issues and successes early on and give you that fast feedback that you're looking for. What this will also do is if it's integrated often, it will keep the project demo ready. And what I mean by this is that at some point in time, you will have a demo. This is either going to be because you are in an agile environment and there's a regular cadence for demos where you show off your work to the stakeholders or the stakeholder will come to you at some point and say, have you done this yet? Is it ready yet? I would like to see something. You know, is there any progress you can show? And by having your project demo ready, that means that you, your project is now available for the feedback that the stakeholder is looking to give you. So if it takes you a week or two weeks or longer to integrate the work that you're making to show it to the stakeholder, you've just missed an opportunity for that feedback that was available at that time. But if you can be demo ready in minutes or hours, then, then that feedback is readily available to you in, in order to be able to uh, improve on the project and have that agile mindset. On the flip side, 
isolating your work and being able to um, constrain the context will give you faster feedback for the for the narrow problem that you're trying to solve in that particular module or component. So again, you'll have this tension between integrating frequently and isolating it to be able to get the feedback that you need, both in the macro and micro scale. Other adjustments you can make in the process are related to tests. Clearly, I've mentioned tests a lot in this presentation, and uh, I have a strong bias towards having tests. So it's no surprise that it's showing up again. So with tests, uh, and these are these are not manual tests. These are tests that can run automatically that indicate the intent of what the code is supposed to do. What they provide you is they, they tell you that you didn't break anything. So if you make a change and the test still pass, you have high confidence that your, your app is still going to work. If you did break something, but you were expecting to, so you added a feature that you're like, oh, this is going to break a lot of my tests, and the tests break, you have now validated that you, not only did you have good tests, but that you did introduce a breaking change that is intentional. And you know, finally, if you, if you have the tests and you make the changes to the code and the tests work as expected, like you have a lot of confidence that the work that you added was correct and you created the working software that you are intending. Now, something to think about is that the code actually changes every time you touch the keyboard. Obviously, it changes the most out of anything in the project. And when you hear change, you should be thinking potentially breaks. So every time you touch the keyboard, you could potentially break your, your, your application. And having tests is like your change management utility belt. It is your, it is your safety net. It is your tool set. It is, every, it is everything that you need to prove that the code that you are writing works and that the changes that you are making continue to work. Now, I'd be remiss at this point if I didn't talk about TDD. TDD is test-driven development. And it is the idea that you would write tests first and then add the implementation to make those tests pass. Um, it provides a concrete reason to write code and pro provides predictive validation to an implementation. And the reason why TDD is really cool, it's a really neat idea, is for that one agile principle that's talking about simplicity, the art of writing as little as possible to solve the problem. And TDD speaks directly to that. So if you write a test that's failing and you write an implementation that makes that test pass, you have written, hopefully, probably, the most simplest way, the most simplest version of what you can do to make that pass. So also with tests, um, it gives you the ability to run your code frequently. And so like personally, I don't, I don't know what the, and personally, like after 10 or 15 minutes, maybe even a half an hour of writing code, if I haven't executed that code, I start to feel really anxious. And I look, I look for a way to actually execute that code and having the tests make that really easy. Now, the picture I put on the slide, it's a, it's a game called Lightbot. And I have volunteered at my, at my kids' elementary school during the hour of code. And this is a, a simple little um, program that you know, introduces some of the concepts of coding. The idea is that the little robot you know, kind of hops forward on these squares and he's supposed to add a light to the blue squares. Now, 90% of the kids who tried this put in every single command. Basically, the command is, you know, walk three steps forward, add a light, turn right, walk three steps forward, add a light, turn right, etc. Now, like as I said, 90% of the students would implement all of the commands before testing it. And invariably, they put in the wrong direction to turn and the little robot would fall off the edge and you know, they didn't win the game. Um, and this is, this is this, this feeling of, I wanna make sure my code is working at these very small steps. So like every one or two steps that this robot could take, I would run, I would run the code and see if I, I did the right thing. And so tests allow me to do that. Tests allow me to run the code quickly to make sure I haven't fallen off the edge, this case may be. So the biggest benefit to tests is that, number one, the app is testable. You end up with something that you can prove that it works. And you can prove that it works as expected. As we said, working software is 25% of the Agile principles. 
the other benefit of test is that it will alert you quickly if it breaks. Now you may be thinking, why is this a tactical adjustment? Um, you've spent a long time talking about tests. So here it is. If you don't have tests, add them. And if you do have tests, continue to update them along with your project. That is the adjustment that you need to make, is to make sure that you have and continue to update the tests that are in your project. That is the, the uh, tactical adjustment that I'm providing to you. So next, we're moving on to the mindset. So the mindset for, for, an, ad, for, an, for an Agile um, mindset um, comes down to a couple of things. One is changes and change requests. In your mind, try to flip the conversation to use the changing requirements as feedback to improve the design. Try not to think of it as um, a change or as a frustration or why didn't we think of this before, but more of like, that's a good idea. We should incorporate this into the design because of this feedback. Again, keep the mindset of having your project be demo ready. As I said before, is that if the app can be demoed on short notice, timely feedback will be readily available. So whatever this means in terms of your build process, your check-in process, your code review process, if you can have something be demo ready, understanding that it's obviously not the complete project, but if someone comes to request it or you are in a sprint and your sprint ends and it's time for the demo, if it takes just a couple of minutes to build it, build out your app and be able to show something, you're able to collect feedback from that, from that, from that moment. Another, another mindset to uh, adopt is to lead by example and to demonstrate value and effectiveness to communicate and most importantly, to create the path for your team to follow. So for example, if you don't have tests already in your project, maybe you can create the first one. Um, the first one is the hardest because you have to choose the framework and the, the environment and all those things. And then just leave like one test available for your team to, to, uh, to pick up on. Or maybe if you are, don't have a retrospective, maybe you can advocate for one. Um, maybe you are the person who, you know, make sure every column in the retrospective, the uh, continue, stop, and ideas column, maybe you contribute to each one of those. But lead by example and, and give people a, a, a path to follow. By doing so, you'll create something called a vulnerable trust. Now, vulnerable trust, the definition of it is being able to com comfortably and quickly acknowledging without provocation your own mistakes, weaknesses, failures, and needs for help. You also recognize the strengths of others, even when those strengths exceed your own. So with vulnerable trust, this is the, the space needed to, to grow the collaboration on your team. And by showing vulnerab vulnerability in terms of I've made a mistake or I don't understand or I need help or um, uh, I didn't do this right or, I'm, or whatever, um, showing vulnerability helps allow others to feel more comfortable being open and honest with their own concerns, questions, mistakes, and roadblocks, which ultimately leads to, leads to a stronger collaboration. So easy ways that you can show vulnerability in this vulnerable trust is to ask for help or ask for feedback. Um, admit your mistakes and, let, and actually let others help you. So if you have asked for help or if you get feedback that is not solicited, Use active listening skills and let other people help you um, get through that. So some examples of where vulnerability comes in and to be acknowledged is maybe you've worked a long time on a, a section of code or a component and have taken a dead end and you have, you've discovered a better solution and you need to throw this entire chunk of code away. And just to acknowledge that to your team, it says, hey, I, I took a wrong turn and I wasted some velocity on uh, this path. Um, and then recognize that every comment or critique is an opportunity to learn. So whether you're doing code reviews or whether someone says whatever they say, as opposed to taking it as a defensive, defensive 
interpretation, if you can interpret that as like, yes, I can learn from this, thank you. Now, in terms of vulnerability, uh, reacting to vulnerability is most important for the collaboration and establishing the connection. Because research has shown that it is the receiver of the vulnerability signal that builds the relationship. If you can imagine that you're, you know, you're stuck on something and you ask for help and no one responds, how do you think that's gonna make you feel, right? You're gonna feel like you're alone on this, this journey delivering this valuable piece of software to the company. But if someone comes back and says, yes, I can help you with that, then you have a relationship and you know that you are, you're not alone and you know that you are um, able to, to build that relationship with that feedback. Now, even asking for help, if you are on a team of one, you know, reaching out to your customer, to your client and saying, I don't understand this. I need help with this. Can you help? Like that's, that's another place. It doesn't, this doesn't all have to be from your team. It can be from anyone you're in contact with that's involved in the project. So some ways to react to vulnerability is to pair a program, like always jump in if someone asks for help or if someone is even saying I'm struggling with this or it's not a direct call for help, but a indirect call for help. Like respond, especially now when we're all in these Zoom or team meetings, um, oftentimes like the project manager will ask a question, like even like, are we ready to start the meeting? And it's, de it's dead silence. Like you just crickets of no one's willing to like unmute and say, yes, go ahead and start. Um, they put themselves out there, even though it's just, you know, simple as starting a meeting, just uh, having a response again helps build that collaboration. And it shows others that you're willing to collaborate. And then just be available to listen. Be available for rubber duck discussions. Um, if you're not familiar with the term rubber duck, it's the idea that explaining a problem or, or what you're working on to somebody else usually leads to you solving the problem yourself with the other person doing very little other than listening. The idea being that if you don't have someone to talk to, to put a rubber duck on your desk and then to explain your problem to the rubber duck, in this, much the same way that you explain it to another person. That has then kind of expanded just to become rubber ducking as a, I've listened to you explain your problem, but I didn't provide any input or guidance, but you solved the problem because I was available for you to listen. So just being available to listen for other people to describe their problem usually helps them solve it. So with all of these things, all of these, um, uh, adjustments that you can make, patience is probably one of the most important because change is hard. All of Agile is focused on change and making improvements and doing these things, but change is hard. And you might be doing all the leading by example with no one following you. You could be the person writing all of the tests and hopefully you're able to check them in, but maybe you're not. Maybe, you're, maybe you have all the tests and no one's following you. Maybe you are actively pushing for retrospectives and no one else wants to share. And it, as I said, it takes patience, it takes persistence and, um, you know, tenacity to, to make some of these changes happen. A reminder of the goal. The goal is moving the needle an increment closer to the improvement, not actually getting to the improvement. Obviously getting to the full improvement is great, but the goal is, can I take one step closer? Can I shave off, you know, a hair or two hairs of of distance to this improvement. That's the actual goal of some of these adjustments. And if you continue to do that over time, all of a sudden you'll have gotten to the full improvement in these tiny steps. So one example of this is let's say going back to the treat the warning as errors. Let's say you have 3000 warnings. Maybe the goal is that you just don't produce any more warnings. Maybe the goal is that you keep, you, you maintain the 3000 warnings for two or three sprints. Then maybe the next goal is I'm only going to reduce warnings in files that I've been working on. So maybe you go from 3000 to, you know, 2950 warnings. And then that's great. Like you're, you're slowly moving them down. And that's kind of an, that's kind of the implementation of like moving this needle incrementally closer. Like I wouldn't go in and spend a full sprint getting rid of all 3000 warnings, but over time, make sure that they don't increase, make sure you whittle them down slowly. 
that's kind of how these implementations work. So that wraps up uh, the adjustments that you can make to help improve feedback. And again, I have a little anecdote that I want to share related to these. So especially now that we are home with my whole family, I'll, I'll get really excited during the day. I'll get really excited like when my tests fail. And my kids will come in and say, hey, what's going on? I was like, oh, my test failed. This is great. And they're really confused because they're in school. And they're trying to say, like, I don't understand. Why is failing tests a good thing? And I tried to explain that for them, failing a test is bad. But for me, failing a, a, a failing test means that I either, number one, um, I put something in that I shouldn't have, and I got notified before it went to PR, QA, um, you know, even in production, I got notified really quickly, so I'm excited that I caught it. Or alternatively, um, I'm putting something in that I expected to break, and it did break, which means that I had good test coverage, and the breaking change that I'm adding did prove that I, that I broke it correctly, and I need to go adjust my tests. So I'm excited when that happens. And I'm really anxious at the point where if I put in a change and my tests don't fail, that makes me scared. That means I, that means my tests aren't covering the things that they should be covering. Um, let's say I change a, an enum, that means there's a value that it's not represented anywhere. So I'm, I'm freaked out when tests don't fail. But trying to explain that to my kids, they, they, I don't think they've even got it yet. They don't understand that failing tests can be a good thing. So moving on to our collaborative environment. Um, again, this is collaborative environment for feedback and, and communication specifically. You can't talk about collaboration without conversation. So conversations are going to be our first topic on here. So the conversations that you are most likely having are stand-ups or similar to stand-ups. If you're not actively agile, you likely have a status meeting or some conversation with a stakeholder, project manager, someone that's explaining something. Um, if you are having stand-ups, hopefully they're daily or every other day or, or frequent, um, but recognize that the stand-ups are actually for the team, not necessarily for the management. The goal of the stand-up is to tell the team what you were able to do yesterday, what you committed to yesterday that you were not able to do, um, why you were not able to finish what you said you were going to do, what blockers you have, what code you're working on, um, giving them the opportunity to, to help jump in, say, I'm already working on that, or the story that I'm working on is similar, we're going to have merge conflicts. Um, these stand-ups should be the, the you know, impetus to start having additional conversations about what's going on with you and your story and the code that you're working on. So keep your team in mind as the target audience for these conversations. There's a, there's a quote in the Agile space called uh, saying, stop starting, start finishing. And this talks to the point of making sure that your, your project, your story, the code that you're working on gets done, whatever your definition of done is, before you pick up the next thing. This is not just throwing it over the wall to QA and calling it done. This is making sure that it gets to QA, making sure that QA knows how to test it, making sure that um, it's all set up for them and it's working to the point where it's fully done before you pick up the next thing so that you have more things finished. Again, working software is more valuable than not working software. So in the, it's better to have you know, one story that is finished and working than to have three stories in progress that are not yet working. So that, that's where this quote kind of comes from. Other conversations to have is to be a mentor. And Mark Runyon had a great presentation earlier today about being a mentor and what mentor, mentorship is. But it, it's, mentoring is not just a person with more experience, you know, giving advice to a person with less experience. It's, it's all directions. It could be same level experience. It could even be a less experience giving to higher experience. Um, I had a mentor many years ago who very much my senior um, had way more experience than I did. He, he taught me a huge amount. Now we kept it in touch after the project finished and a couple years later, 
he, he reached out to me and just really said, wanted to say thank you to me for all that I had taught him. And I was floored because I was like, no, you taught me all of these things. And he corrected me saying that I taught him just as much as he taught me. And it was really eye-opening to that, that it is a two-way, it is a full two-way conversation. And it could be as easy as, uh, you know, hey, you're new on this team, let me show you how the code works or let me show you how we check in or, or run these, you know, run our tests. It could be as, as simple as reaching out and just saying, are you okay? You know, how are you managing through the pandemic? What do you need anyone to talk to? Um, just reaching out and being a mentor and, and connecting with people that way. It's really beneficial both for the mentor and the mentee. Um, and then as the mentor, as the person, uh, you know, reaching out, um, as I said, it's a two-way street. It's a great way to get feedback, new perspectives, um, differences of opinion, uh, another good source for, for feedback. And it leads to this quote that knowledge is unique in the fact that it grows when you share it. And this is, this is absolutely true. Another conversation in terms of the collaboration is, is the idea that you want to keep other people informed. Uh, this is, this comes down to like transparency and trust, um, going back to that vulnerable trust, but you want to announce early if you are, if you're churning, if you think your deadline's at risk, if your estimates are slipping. The way that I, I tell this is that so I used to teach at university for uh, eight or nine years, and I would tell my students that if you tell me, you know, the day that the project is due, that you won't be able to turn it in, there's nothing I can do for you. I'm gonna be quite mean and rigid. Um, if you tell me like, you know, hey, the project's due in an hour and you're not gonna be able to do it. But if you tell me, you know, that morning or the day before or, or however as early as you can, that you're not gonna be able to deliver the project because some relative is sick or because you are overloaded with tests or whatever, I can make adjustments because I have the time. You've, you've allowed me the time to deal with that risk appropriately. And the way that this applies to a business is that when there's a deadline for a business, you don't know what other downstream resources are lined up for that deadline. For example, legal needs to be on board to validate that it can go to production. Maybe there's a marketing push that has those dates on it. Um, and if you come in the day of the deadline and say, sorry, I didn't make it, then all that downstream resources are, effect are affected. But if you can come in early, and say, you know what? I think that the deadline is at risk for these reasons. You give the business the opportunity to manage the risk appropriately and uh, do what they need to do, either add more resources or remove those blockers or you know, change the deadline if that's possible. But again, this takes, this takes that trust, this takes that vulnerable trust, it takes the courage to be able to say, I don't think I can meet the deadline. I don't think um, you know, this can happen. And hopefully you have a safe environment that you can project this vulnerable trust and work through that together as part of this conversation. So the next part of collaboration comes down to the artifacts that we produce. So every artifact is an invitation to a conversation. Whether this artifact is the code or the tests or the documentation or the stories or tasks that we're working on or even the burn charts that we're looking at. Uh, every one of these artifacts could be a new invitation to a conversation. Um, and they should be treated that way. Hopefully you'll remember that the stories that are on the backlog are indeed invitations to conversations. They, they should not be the full detailed um, spec of, what to be, of what's to be implemented without any hope of communicating about it, asking questions, um, challenging it at all. It should be this this invitation that says, "What did you mean when you said it? It you know should roll over whenever you do this, or what do you mean when it said it should pop up when it should do this?" So, uh, as part of the artifacts, the code the code clarity should take priority over excessive performance. Now, I have put an asterisk on here because I say this in most cases. If your SLA, your uh, service level agreement dictates a certain level of performance, clearly you need to meet that. 
But outside of that, um, expressiveness, readability, comprehension should be the highest priority after working code, um, but above performance. Because as I said, it's going to be read orders of magnitude more than it's going to be executed. And recognize that simple code is not simplistic. Um, what I mean by that is that looking at this quote from Mark Twain, Mark Twain says, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. And this applies to code too. It's difficult to write short, concise, readable, understandable code. It's a lot easier to write verbose code that does a whole bunch of things, that's copy and pasted from somewhere else that kind of works with some minor changes. Um, and it, it ends up like you end up with all this verbosity that makes it harder to understand what the code is actually supposed to do. So it is, it is challenging, but it's very worthwhile. Now moving on to talking about outcomes. Outcomes are the most important, right? We said working code is what we're trying to get to. With the outcomes, we need to disregard credit, blame, intellectual prowess, code ownership, and other similar imposters. So it doesn't matter who wrote the code. It doesn't matter if the code was you know, great or poor. If it's working and it's readable, then that's what matters. <clears throat> and uh, if it breaks, it also doesn't matter that it breaks. It just matters that you fix it and move on and not blame others. Which leads to this quote, that if you aren't making any mistakes, you probably aren't trying hard enough. So if you get to the point that your code never breaks or uh, you don't get any feedback on it or you know, code reviews come back with no comments, something's not right. There needs to be, there needs to be failure, like there, failure in a small scale. There needs to be learning happens, adjustments happen in the uncomfortable spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. So if everything is comfortable and no one's critiquing anything and it's never failing, you're probably not trying hard enough. Then next, we need transparency. This comes back to that vulnerable trust. Um, so in, in transparency, I would recommend reporting your time remaining on a given task versus the amount that you have complete. For example, the amount that you have complete s sounds like this. Oh, I'm 90% done. And then the next day you're like, I'm still 90% done. And then, you know, the day after that's like, I'm 92% done and 95% done. And you never actually get to done. That's what I'm saying to not do. What I would recommend is saying, I believe I have three hours left. And then the next day saying something came up, I still have three hours left. And then the day after that saying, you know what, uh, this was easier than I thought, I'm done, or it was harder than I thought and I actually have five hours left now. Or I ran into this other issue and this whole thing is blown up and we need to reevaluate this whole story. Um, that's the kind of transparency that talking about the time remaining allows you to have and the conversations allows you to have. Uh, check in your work frequently for others to see. If you have a story that's going to last half a sprint or a whole sprint or multiple sprints, see if you can figure out ways to um, break it down enough that you can check it in so other people can start checking your work so you, you can get that feedback from people reading your code. So you can create those breakpoints that other people can communicate with you on, on how, how things are going. And then also as you're working, uh, set a personal time limit for yourself for churn. I think everyone can recognize on their own when they are spinning their wheels and when they're actually converging. And if that time for spinning your wheels kind of exceeds your, uh, this preset limit, that's the time to reach out and ask for help saying, I don't know why it's, it's not working. Can someone look over my shoulder? Can, do you mind me you know, having a rubber duck session with me to, so I can explain this to you? Um, and that's a really good way of establishing this transparency, establishing this vulnerable trust and getting that feedback and that collaboration. So again, with this agile mindset, the feedback, the adjustments and the collaboration are is what necessary to build this agile mindset. So I'm almost near the end of my presentation 
Now is a good time to start asking questions if you haven't done so already. The Teams environment takes several seconds for those questions to process. So by the time I'm done with the next couple of slides, those questions should be there ready for me to, to answer. So moving on to a story about my collaboration. This is one of my favorite collaboration stories. I was on a team with, it was a very small team. It was me as the developer, there was a QA person and a designer and the Scrum Master project manager. And so I was starting on, on starting on one of the features. I got the happy path done and I reached out to the QA person and I said, well, what do you think of this? And he's like, okay, well, now what you need to do, you know, click here, tab twice, and then see what happens. I was like, tab? I didn't put any keyboard navigation in. I didn't know about that. He's like, give me a couple hours, I'll be, I'll come back. So I go, I implement the keyboard nav keyboard navigation. I come back to the QA person. He's like, okay, click here, tab twice, click over here, then do these couple things. I'm like, no one talked about those other couple things. Give me a couple hours. And so we kept iterating like this until eventually it started out where whenever I would get a new feature, I would talk to the QA person first. I was like, how are you going to test this? What are you going to do? What are you going to be looking for? And we would start out with this conversation, even pair program where I would you know, implement some of his ideas right away. It got to the point where nothing ever failed QA. There was nothing ever that ever came back that said it didn't work because the QA person and myself worked so closely and collaborated so much on each individual feature that it all just passed. It was amazing. It was a great, great feeling to, um, to be able to work in that kind of environment, to be able to collaborate with you know, one of the stakeholders that was downstream. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was, it was really great to get that feedback quickly and early. So in summary, before I get to the questions, agile development uses feedback to make constant adjustments in a highly collaborative environment. The individual yourself can strongly influence more than 50% of all of the aspects of agile development. So with that, I will take any questions if there are any. Drew, um, we don't have any questions that have come in yet in the Q&A. Okay. Looks like, looks like you've nailed all the content and there are no questions yet. <laughs> all right, sounds good. I'll stick around for a couple minutes, but here's my information. You can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. And this presentation will be available on my blog as well as on the Houston Tech Fest site here shortly. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, if any questions come up here in the next couple of minutes, I'll definitely I'll definitely send them over your way. Um, otherwise, um, awesome presentation. I really enjoyed that personally. It was very informative for me. Um, and to all those who are attending today, I just want to say a quick thank you. Of course, and Drew, again, thanks for sharing. Um, also, the recording, as Drew was saying, of this session is going to be available on HoustonTechFest.com soon. Um, please feel free to, to rewatch that and any if there are any gems of information you'd like to take away from there um, know that this will be available soon um, and with that i think um drew i don't see any of the questions coming in um, just want to say a quick thank you to everybody for joining and hope you enjoy the rest of the virtual houston tech fest everybody have a good day and thanks again drew